You know, of all of the popular baby names that we can come up with, one name I've never heard anyone name their son is Judas. Hey, I'm Bishop A. Reginald Littman, host of the Midweek Refill and senior pastor of the New Mountaintop Church. You're watching the Midweek Refill. This is part 12 of a 12-week series called Life Lessons from the 12 Disciples. And in part 12, we're going to talk about why you don't hear that name, Judas, in a positive way. Stay tuned. Hey friends, welcome back to part 12 of this wonderful series on life lessons from the 12 disciples. I am excited to welcome you to this study and this 12th part of the series as we're talking about from betrayal to redemption, exploring the life of Judas Iscariot. And I'm Bishop A. Reginald Lippman, and I want to welcome you, and I'm so happy that you're here with us as we talk about this 12th disciple who represents so many different things as it relates to walking with God and how not to walk with God. So if you're here for the first time, welcome to the series. Go back and check out all of the 11 previous videos. And also, there is a free PDF handout in the description box below that I would love for you to go and access right after you get through uh, watching today's teaching. It has full notes as well as personal discovery questions that will help you to take a deeper dive into this study. Well, why don't we jump in? Because through this study, we're going to examine the background, his role as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and the lessons that we can draw from his life. So let's talk a little bit about the background of Judas Iscariot. Because Judas's background comes from a place called Kiriath. This would be the hill country of Judah. It's a town in the region of Judah. And he was chosen by Jesus to be one of the 12 disciples. What a blessing that is to come from an obscure place that's not known for a whole lot of positive things and yet to be chosen by Jesus. You know what that indicated? It indicated that initially, at least, Judas was considered trustworthy and capable of following Jesus' teachings. So when we think about his profession and his calling, as we kind of looked at all of the other of the 12 disciples and their professions and calling there's not a whole lot that is indicated in Scripture pertaining to his profession. He could have been uh, a part of the fishing trade, as were many of the other of the 12 disciples. This would be quite common in their time to take up fishing as a common occupation of that time. And also, he could have been a farmer because this would have been the other likely profession that many of the disciples and people of their time would actually take up. So like the other disciples, regardless to what his profession was, Judas's call to follow Jesus was followed up with a response to the call to follow him. And Judas, like the others, left behind the previous life to become a disciple and a witness to the ministry of Jesus the Christ. You and I should all be willing to walk away from the familiar to follow in faith, because faith is not familiar. Faith involves complete trust. I love the acronym F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all I trust in him. That's what faith really is, and we see that exercised and implemented in the life of Judas. So Judas's life concerning his family is also very scarce in the Bible. We don't have a lot of detail pertaining to the family life of Judas. But what we do know is that his surname 
Iscariot is often interpreted to mean man from Kiriath, man from Kiriath. And this suggested a potential connection between Judas and his hometown of Kiriath. Now, I don't know if we should base how we view the little city of Kiriath on Judas's choices, <laughs> but it's just a reminder that wherever we go, we take with us where we come from. And uh, the actions that we take are a reflection on where we come from, you know, which is why if you had old school parents like I did, they would often say, don't go off and mess up our good name, right? So we don't know whether or not uh, Kiriath was a place of people who would love you this minute and betray you the next or not. But what we do know is that the, the surname is relevant to the city that he was from. Beyond that point, though, there's very little known pertaining to his family background. So let's talk about some of the key moments in Judas's life, some of the key moments in Judas's life, and they are quite poignant for this week's study. So number one, Judas was chosen as a disciple. He was chosen as a disciple. You know, that's really good news to me. That's really a great reminder that no matter where you come from, small town, large town, good name, bad name, uh, family with positive history, family with negative history, Jesus can still choose you and use you if you allow him to do so as one of his disciples. I'm glad he chose me. Judas was among the 12 disciples that were literally handpicked by Jesus to accompany him during his earthly ministry. In fact, we see that in Matthew chapter 10, verse number one through four. And it reads like this. Jesus called his disciples, his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother, Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. And you'll find Judas in verse 4, and typically he's going to be listed last. Verse 4, Simon the Zealot, And Judas Iscariot, and please make note of this distinction that permanently itched and stained the life of Judas. Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. You know, I don't know about you, fam, but I really am so thankful that the mistakes I've made in my life and the sins I've made in my life are not attached to my name and that every time my name is called, my sin is thought of. But when he betrayed Jesus, he became known as not only Judas Iscariot, Judas from the little town of Kiriath, but Judas from Kiriath who also betrayed Jesus. So there's another great key point in his life that we see in the life of Judas, and that is that Judas became the treasurer of the group. He became the treasurer of the group. So Judas was actually entrusted with the financial affairs of the disciples and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, pause. I know what you're thinking. Why on earth would Jesus make trouble the treasurer? Why would he make a denier the one over the dollars? I I got you. I'm right there with you. And I've thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And the answer is this right here. And it's going to be profound. I don't know. What I do know is that the Lord will give you a chance to change. And he'll provide opportunities for you to make a difference. And he will be kind enough to give you moments of reflection 
and opportunities for advancement, but it's up to you to take advantage of the opportunities that the Lord provides for your enhancement and advancement. Nonetheless, Judas is the treasurer of the group, and he was entrusted with all of the financial affairs. So we're talking about if there were any bills to be paid, any recording of uh, contributions when it was tax time, Judas was the man to go to regarding money matters. But this indicates a high level of trust that was placed on Judas by not just Jesus, but the whole group of them. In fact, let's look at what the scripture says concerning Judas and his role as treasurer. John 12 Verse four through six is the story of it's the story of the woman who found Jesus as he was relaxing in a house after dinner and comes and worships him, but she worships him in a way that was expensive because she brings her most costly, precious ointment, pours it willingly on the feet of Jesus, begins to massage it in with her hair, dry it with her hair. So she lets down her hair. By the way, the only time that a woman would let down her hair in public was when she was going to bed. So this created quite the conundrum for Jesus and those who were standing by with critical comments. And for the non-followers of Christ, they were like, you know, look, I told you he hangs out with prostitutes and sinners and those kinds of things. I told you this guy's of ill repute. But there's another problematic group in the room known as the disciples. And I want you to see what our friend Judas had to say, who is over the money matters of the whole Christian camp at the time. And so verse 4 of John 12 says, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was who was later to betray him? Did you did you catch that? Uh, they made sure you knew who, who they were talking about. The one that's going to betray him. Watch this. So, uh, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Verse five. Why wasn't this perfume sold, and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Now that tells you the value of her worship was a year's wages. So he says it was worth a year's wages. So he didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Mm. Wow. (laughs) So he's a treasurer. He's also a thief but he's also given an opportunity to serve and to honor his position. So Judas is entrusted with the finances of Jesus and the disciples. And it was the greatest indication of their level of confidence in him. Now that's a bit problematic, isn't it? Um, Because why would Jesus trust somebody that he know he couldn't trust? Well, That kind of leads us to our third key, because I want to tell you something up front. Everybody matters. Everybody's important. Everybody has a role to play, even in your own life. Let's look at the third key moment in the life of Judas, and that's this, the betrayal of Jesus. The betrayal of Jesus. Perhaps the most infamous moment in Judas's life would be his betrayal of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And this would be the very thing that would lead to Jesus's arrest and his crucifixion. Now catch this. Here's why Judas had to be in the position that he was. He was a part of the story of redemption. If Judas had not betrayed him with the kiss, they needed somebody up close and personal to betray Jesus, somebody who knew exactly who he was, 
so that they would apprehend the right person and ultimately crucify him. So Judas is in a trusted position as treasurer, not because he's a great treasurer. Jesus knew he stole. (laughs) Jesus knew he was shady. Jesus knew he was going to betray him. He even told him so at the Last Supper. But he trusted him to follow through with God's plan, which was for him to be the one to set Jesus up. And when we look at this, there's so many lessons in this because sometimes we have people in our lives and in our surroundings who we know we can't trust. But even they are in your life, in your space and in your face and in your place for a divine purpose. So this is so powerful. Let's look at the scriptures concerning Judas's betrayal of our Savior. Matthew 26, verse 14 through 16 says, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? Did you, did you, did you catch that? So it wasn't as if they came and pursued to see which of the disciples was the weakest link. But he goes to them, rather, and says, hey, how much are you willing to pay me if I show you who he is? How much are you willing to uh, shell out if I give you a glimpse of who this man named Jesus is? And the scripture goes on to say, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. They counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over for 30 pieces of silver. Before we move further, are we selling Jesus out? What do you mean? Glad you asked. Are are we just quickly and easily disposing of him, his principles, his ways, his thoughts, the things that he wants us to do? Are we compromising who we are, how we are, what we represent for trinkets or for privileges of freedom? Are we discarding who Jesus is? And the reason why I wanted to talk about that is because we are so quick to remind ourselves of Judas's betrayal of Jesus. But how quick are we to think about our own habits and characteristics? Are we also selling Jesus out or trading him or just exchanging Jesus and his principles? and his policies, and his word for our own preferences. Hmm. Something to think about, isn't it? So as we think along the lines of Judas's betrayal of Jesus, let's go to a very powerful other key point in his life. That is remorse and suicide. After realizing the gravity of his betrayal, Judas experienced deep remorse and ultimately took his own life. The scripture teaches us concerning this in Matthew 27, verse 3 through 5. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, He was seized with remorse. Isn't that interesting? Jesus was seized by the Romans. Judas was seized by remorse. And he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. And listen to what he says. This is so powerful. Don't miss this, please. I have sinned, he said for I have betrayed innocent blood. Listen to their response. 
What is that to us? They replied. We don't care. That's your problem. That's your responsibility. Verse 5, so Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and hanged himself. Now, many people argue and debate on whether or not Judas made it in and all of that. And I'm not here to even discuss that. But there's something I do want to point out in this passage of Scripture. Let's look at it again. It says in verse number four, Judas talking here says, I have sinned for I have betrayed innocent blood. Family, whether you want to believe it or not, that was repentance. That was remorse. That was an expression of wrong. That was a confession of a fault or of a sin. And some would say that the fact that he hang himself means that he committed the ultimate sin that you cannot come back from. And you know what? I don't think God ever wants anyone to commit suicide. I, I just don't believe that he gives us the right and the privilege, or if you want to call it that, to take our own lives. We didn't create our lives. Therefore, I don't think God gives us the right to take our lives. But what I do know is that, at least in Judas's case, that grace covered him in the moment that he acknowledged and repented of that sin. Now, whether or not he went to heaven, hey, I believe personally that uh, when you've been born again, that as John 10 says, no one can pluck you out of the Savior's hand. You can't even remove yourself. However, that's not a, a justification for anyone taking their lives. Never is it right to do that. But I do believe that grace covers and hides a multitude of sin, a multitude of faults. And in that moment, we see Judas come back to redemption, back to a place in God where he recognizes the totality of who it is that he's been walking with these three and a half years. And so, brothers and sisters, let's look at now some of the lessons that we can draw from Judas's life, and they are numerous. Here's number one. Recognize the dangers of greed. Recognize the dangers of greed. Judas's betrayal stemmed from his love of money, greed as the treasurer of Jesus and the disciples. We have to guard against the temptation to prioritize material wealth and possessions over spiritual values. So we have to be careful that we recognize the dangers of greed. And when we look at Luke 12, 15, then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions and family. What if we lived out that principle that life is not about things and trinkets and toys and possessions or positions but it's all about having Jesus in our lives. But let's look at another lesson here from the life of Judas. That is the importance of authentic faith, the importance of authentic faith. You see, despite the fact that Judas was chosen by Jesus as a disciple, Judas lacked genuine faith and allowed his greed to corrupt his heart. True discipleship, I'm going to say that again. True discipleship involves sincerity and devotion to Christ. So when we think about the importance of authentic faith, let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, because there we really see the principle personified. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Verse 23, then I will say to them plainly, 
I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. When we look at that passage of scripture, it reminds us of the necessity to have authenticity in our walk with God. Let's pick up another of the strong life lessons that we can learn from the life of Judas, and that is the lesson of confronting sin and repentance. Confronting sin and repentance. Now, Judas's tragic end really serves as a reminder of the destructive consequences of unrepented sin in our hearts. Judas thought this was the only way out. He didn't understand that grace was already ahead of him and upon him. And he was a part of God's plan. But family, you and I are called to actually acknowledge our wrongdoing, seek forgiveness, and to turn away from our sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, family, it's all about confessing and expressing. And when we confess and express our wrong and our wrongfulness to God, know what he'll do? He will address our wrong and make our wrong into something that can be used for his glory. That's the power of, of Jesus and his blood and his grace and his mercy. Let's finally close with some points to ponder this week as we think about the lessons that we learn from the life of Judas. So here's number one. Examine your motives. Examine your motives. Are there areas in your life where worldly desires overshadow your commitment to following Christ? Well, take action. Realign your priorities with God's will as you examine your motives. Here's number two. Evaluate your faith. Evaluate your faith. Reflect on the authenticity of your faith. Are you merely going through the motion? Are you just going to church? Or are you changing? Do you genuinely seek to honor God in every aspect of your life? And here's number three. Choose repentance. Choose repentance. So if you strayed from God's path, and we all have from time to time, don't hesitate to seek his forgiveness and to turn away from sin because God's grace is so sufficient to redeem even the most broken and contrite hearts. And as you think on the life of Judas this week, even as we are now in the Lent season, what changes do you need to make? As you reflect on all 12 of these sessions, all 12 of these apostles, what do you take from it? What do you need to leave as you found it, what do you need to change, shift, and adjust so that you can be the disciple he wants you to be, choosing repentance and walking in his way for your life? Hey, I want to thank you so much for watching. Thank you for tuning in. This has been the Midweek Refill. I'm Bishop A. Reginald Littman, your host, and I want to encourage encourage you to like, share, follow, subscribe, and please leave a comment. Let us know what speaks to you. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to grab the free PDF handout that is in the description box below. And until next time, you go with God.